The world is waking up to the power of crypto, and we are seeing this with new NFT and token launches every day, all using blockchain technologies. We're also seeing huge marketing spends by crypto exchanges and platforms. And so this season, we are speaking to the marketing leaders of those crypto companies. Hosted by Brave Software and me, Donnie Tavorin. You're listening to a new episode of the Brave Marketer podcast, and we have an exciting one for you because we're talking to Dylan Duny, and he is the co-founder and lead initiator at two different companies, NFT3.com and also Kylan Network. And I met Dylan, we want to say three years ago at an IEB event. He was up on a panel, really impressed with him. So he's been a big crypto supporter and enthusiast going all the way back to 2011. So a lot of experience in the space. And he's really been consistently at the forefront, you know, between society and technology and has appeared alongside such luminaries as Edward Snowden and Gavin Wood. And we're going to talk about that in their interview today and specifically some of his takeaways. And his most recent interests and pursuits are in the field of decentralized data monetization. And that's really going to be the focus of today's podcast is DDI, as we call it. That's more for the decentralized identity part of it. Again, in this episode, we talk about ethics, security considerations for sharing your data in a Web3 world. Talked about how do you do it from a B2C perspective? How do you do it from a B2B perspective? And we really talked a lot about like the genome. You know, someone could make like five to fifty thousand dollars off of a genome, and how do you you know prevent fraud and, and everything from happening from there? So I think you're really gonna like this episode. Before we get into the episode, of course, we have our brave pick of the week. Today we are gonna highlight Coca Cola. So we're so excited to highlight Coca-Cola because they ran a sponsored image in Latin America for their This Night to Play campaign. And Latin America is a really growing area for our Brave Ads business. They're you know one of the top markets for us. And it's so great to see a mainstream brand such as Coca-Cola you know, taking notice of the audience we reach there and running on Brave, especially in LATAM. And with no further ado, here is today's episode of The Brave Marketer. Dylan, welcome to the Brave Marketer Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm really good, thank you. And it's a total pleasure to be here. Great. So why don't we just start with your background for a moment. Tell us a little bit about NFT3, a little bit about Kylan. We won't spend too much time there, but I think it'd be nice if you just talked about both those companies and then we can really get into the way we're decentralizing data. Yeah, thank you. So NFT3 and Kylan sort of work synergetically and respectively within this sort of overall theme of how do we think about the transition from web two to web three? And how do we bring to life some a lot of the imagination encapsulated in this idea of going from sort of more of a platform basis to a P2P orientation where we're moving from the internet being like kind of just you know, information to now, you know, assets, right? And not just crypto assets or financial assets, but in fact, the equity that individuals have, the data that we create, share, monetize, operationalize, blah, blah, blah. How does that look in Web3? And so for Kylan, we're thinking about how data is custodied, how data is validated, how we call interesting information off chain, bring it on chain. Similar to, you know, and this is the Oracle functionality with NFT3, we're very, very focused on how does identity play a role and in particular decentralized identity as the nexus for sort of a unified experience, common reference of the individual existing as a sort of data, you know, having their own data equity, their own life that they live in a Web3 context and how they can derive some value or benefit from that. Are both of these companies B2B or there's a direct B2C where consumers can interact with your actual software products? In both companies, they can be B2B or B2C. Now, NFT3 is more B2C oriented because it is very much uh, looking to productize a technology that has recently become a standard. And that technology is decentralized identifiers. And the last time that the World Wide Web Consortium had approved a standard was HTTPS. And this is, in fact, the the latest standard that they've approved. And it's becoming a de rigueur standard for decentralized identity, I guess, or identity within Web3. And there's many projects working 
with DIDS, but we are, you know, we're, we're working with a particularly good iteration of this. And we really want to get people using decentralized identifiers so that when Web3 really comes into reality, they're standing on the doorstep of being able to uh, have a common reference to all of the experiences that they may have in metaversal context, gamified context, et cetera, et cetera. So there's very much a B2C orientation to that. So, so walk me through an example of how a user would do that. Yeah, absolutely. So. I think a really, really cool example of the possibilities of what we're calling, you know, D-data or D-data journey may look like in terms of use casing. And I've talked about it quite a bit in other contexts, but is this idea of, for example, genomics, right? So, so tokenizing your genome, what would that actually look like? So you would, for example, upload your genome to a secure enclave. Every time a researcher dips into your genome, because it's attached to a decentralized or unique identifier, you could get basically paid directly from that. And you may say, oh, this sounds like science fiction. This sounds a little bit like crazy. And why would I want to put you know, my genome up on the web? And why would I want to undergo any friction with that? And is that true? Is our, our researchers actually paying that, a, a lot of money that people would do this? And the answer is, is yes. It's a, it's a business model that, in fact, exists right now, just with, but it's centralized. So companies like 23andMe, Ancestry, they're charging you a couple hundred bucks to swab yourself and get you know some insights about, which is valuable, by the way, I won't discount that, to get some insights maybe about your history or genetic history or whatnot. But on the back end, it's actually a huge part of the revenue generation model of these companies is they sell this genomic information to researchers and they're making enormous deals on it, like tens of millions, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars are being deals are being made to pharmaceutical companies. So it's a business model that exists, but it just exists in a centralized way. You can envision the possibility if people were to uh, securely upload their genome in some sort of like self-custody way, the researchers in a uh, trusted execution environment, whatever that may be, were able to compute upon that information and access it for a fee. That person could be directly uh, monetized just by sharing their genomic information. This is but one use case of you know sharing your data or D data in you know Web three, right? How Kylin kind of like fits into that is we're working on the context for D data marketplaces. So how is data bought and sold when it comes to that? So Kylin would presumably you know three years from now have a well functioning D data marketplace, and researchers would be able to access that data marketplace in order to buy this information, or there would be brokers of that information to say, hey, we are able to you know, sell this uh, en masse in a D-data marketplace, or there are data trusts. And the identity side is you would need to have some way to attach a unique identifier to that genomic information on the application side. So let's say that like you did, we're still using this genomic example. You have a, whatever the company is, it could be centralized, it could not, doesn't really matter, but hopefully it's, it's decentralized. <laughs> and you say, hey, upon sign up, I'm going to give you my DID right? My decentralized identifier, my NFT3 account, and I'm attaching that on signup. I'm going to sign it to prove that I own that DID. And in fact, as part of this process, I uploaded my genome. It's attached now with that DID, right? So that we can, through that person's entire journey of, if it's just a genomic case, we can, we can understand that it's always coming back to the wallet. Say if we want to give them that personal capitalization, like they, they pay, you know, the researchers pay for the access and then that goes directly to the person. This is like a really, really cool example and one that has, I guess, equanimity about it doesn't matter if you're like in Botswana or in Netherlands, your mm-hmm. genomic information has some some value. And in fact, some people's genomic information, regardless of geography, has value over other people's just depending on their particular genome. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of other really cool use cases and examples of how identity can be leveraged within the context of people starting to, and, and their own data within the context of people really self-custodying their data of us turning the the whole basic business model of the internet, which is advertising, which is Brave is doing a bang up job of pushing this narrative, right? And is turning it on its head and saying, listen, you know what? There's a lot of value getting pulled out of people, right? Right? I mean, there's there's value being created because we exist on the internet. 
And now this value, there's every reason to believe this value is going to be coming back to individuals. And, you know, one of the central kind of theses of Kylan to some extent more so NFT3 is that, you know, in, in a couple of years, hopefully when those first stories start coming out of people getting these really interesting personal capitalizations as a result of being responsible custodians of their data journeys or their equity or their life on a decentralized internet, I think the change will happen really, really quickly and rapidly where people say, I don't want to get on Chrome. I don't want to get on Facebook. I, I want to be smart, really intelligent about how I live my life on the internet because mm -hmm. I'm going so, to get paid as a result, right? Like, so how much do you think like in, in a perfect world in three years, somebody's making off of their data? It's hard to say. And I think it's very, and it's quite variable depending on the extent to which we have maturity in the technologies that underlie this. But if I had to like throw some, just some numbers out there. I mean, right now, there's a figure that I've been uh, working with that, you know, the total lifetime value of someone's genome can be anywhere between five and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. So that's that's that's, that's, not, not that's nothing, significant, right? What, what do you think? The, I mean, not everyone's going to upload their genome, but what do you think the top areas of data that they're going to give and get compensated for? I mean, things like you know, male, female, age, how many kids, things like that, or you know, what what are you thinking? I'm thinking there's huge efficiencies to be gained in the context of verifiable credentials, the attestations that can be attached to a unique identifier. And that might sound like gobbledygook, but basically it just means I'm going to attest that something based on my, it can be a centralized thing or a decentralized thing. It can be Subway sandwiches saying like, I'm going to test that you ate a thousand sandwiches and I'll give that attestation. It's going to go on your decentralized identity. And in some way, shape or form, you would be able to leverage that, right? You would be able to leverage that information to gain you some sort of benefit or value. It may not always be strictly like easy to say, like I got a hundred dollars as a result of this, but maybe it's, you get a benefit as to, or of some kind or some sort of like reward as a result of taking part in this platform that's trying to get insight into you. You know, so like, I think that the biggest thing about decentralized identity and about DDAT is that the need for service providers to know about the people that they provide a service to does not go away, right? When we go from web two to web three, in fact, it may even intensify. And we will need to have insight to what people are doing and what we're doing. We will want other entities to have insight into what we're doing, even if we're, even if this whole model is changing, right? Where we're custodying data, where we're sort of arbiters of our own data in control of that process. And it's, you know, not being polished up by another third party and then sold to other people on our behalf. And we just get some free software, right? Like that's going to be like a really important component of all of this. And I think that it's exciting to consider that we'll be able to have kind of these new efficiencies that will be created as a result, right? Like I think in the metaversal context, you know, it's really interesting because it's like, well, if we have a decentralized identity layer, then all of a sudden we have a way to have a common referent to entities and to people. And so you asked earlier about B2C, this doesn't just mean individuals. Maybe there's really cool ways for enterprises to leverage the idle data that they have. And really there's a huge area of consideration here in terms of machine learning, like like machine learning, the, alg the algos of it, it's not like a big problem. It's the bigger problem is the raw data and the sources of data. So, I mean, yeah, so for a company, for, a, for from a B2B perspective, I mean, you'd have to get permission from the user to sell that data. But then that kind of goes against the whole thing where the user owns their data. I mean, is it basically white labeling your technology for them to use with their own users? Yeah, so I, I'm thinking about when it comes to like a B2C kind of context, I'm thinking about data that a business has that they want to share and monetize in a way that would not, I guess, hurt their strategic position. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe Ford has a bunch of data about their cars that could be useful to somebody, right? Or to other enterprises or businesses. Maybe it, it's financial, right? Maybe they're forecasting sales or something like that or, or whatnot. 
that data sits idle or that data is like you know secretly shared in some in some cases but i envision the possibility of being able to sort of like the possibility of businesses to be able to monetize idle data sets that they may already possess so yeah. that might be really cool right like maybe Ford or whatever, it doesn't even matter. I mean, the example, but maybe you, because there's a huge opportunity with ML here where it's sort of like there's a bottleneck in raw data being available to machine learning algorithms. And the reason why is because nobody necessarily wants to share their proprietary data. If you could share it in a, in a secure way where the compute on it happens in a secure way, then like maybe you do that or you know every time it's accessed or you can restrict access or you can say you can access it for this amount of time and there are great projects out there working through some of these ideas in addition to us like oasis labs yeah all right why don't we switch gears for a second and talk to you about your brave marketing moment which is kind of the whole premise of this podcast what's your brave marketing moment dylan it actually it happened recently so we had on the kylan twitter Somebody had written, so I don't know if you're aware, do you know the meme when Lambo? Yeah. So I don't know what that, I, what's that meme mean to you? For me, it's sort of like, when does, the, when does this token explode? And, yeah. You know, like what, like, like what, it's kind of like, when are we going to moon? You know, like when's this going to get on fire? When, when, is, when am I going to be able to buy a Lamborghini with this token? Yeah, exactly. So we had just announced that we had uh 50, like we had just, we started the staking and we had 50 million KYL, which is a native token for Kylan staked. And somebody had written under the th thing, like when Ford focus, like kind of sard sardonically. And I, you know, I was looking and I read it. I'm like, I'm like, let me think. And so I just, I was like, I was like, you know what? If we get our community to write a thousand comments under this, we will buy uh, one of those community members a Ford focus and we'll have them post a picture uh, under here out of spite. Uh, <laughs> to your comment. And you know, I said, let's do it. And so we literally did it. I think it just got run by Crypto Slate today and it just got a thousand comments also today. So we're, we're giving away a Ford Focus. So the brave awesome. moment was sort of just like, sometimes I think you need to be impulsive, believe it or not, in marketing and capture the zeitgeist of, you know, the moment uh, right. or your community, make it fun. Yeah. And, and what do you think, you know, it's a good segue into like what makes a bold marketer. I mean, that's one of the things, right, is choosing something where you there's a moment in time, you capitalize on it, it could blow up in your face, but, you know, you try to do your best. So what else makes a bold marketer? I think it's necessary to take a position, right? Like you have to just, you have to really take a position, not be afraid to have a conviction about whatever it is that you're working on. I think human beings respond to other human beings. And so you have to under, I think you have to like, really like, I guess, underscore whatever you're doing with human emotion, right? Like, you know, sometimes it's levity, right? Which is what we did with this one forward focus thing. But I really think that's important. I don't know about you, but I, I, I think that you really have to appeal to human emotion. Yeah. I mean, that's what marketing is really all about. Like, you want to bring out, you know, whatever it is, make somebody cry, you know, sadness, make them laugh, make them feel joy, whatever it is, because when people have an emotion related to an ad or whatever it is, they remember it so much more versus just kind of, kind of going over their head. And that goes for anything. I mean, there's teachers who talk about that, like they, try, they teach with emotion so the kids remember the concepts. So in your bio, you mentioned you've appeared with Edward Snowden and Gavin Wood. Can you tell us about those events and maybe like the biggest takeaways from them? Yeah. Well, you know, like if I ran into Tom Cruise on the street and maybe that's dating me because he's like maybe not a celebrity anymore. But, oh, yeah, he is. <laughs> but enough, right? I, you know, I'd be like, okay. But like running, you know, being, a, uh, and I've met Gavin a few times now, but being in his presence or, and certainly in Edwards, you know, like I'm very struck by that. So that experience was just huge for me because there are people like that are very much, you know, my heroes, certainly. Where did you meet them? So I met Gavin at a polka dot party. The first time I met him was a polka dot party in New York and, and Edward, sorry, was, was our, our interview. Uh, so virtually, so I didn't meet him in person. What did you interview him for? 
So we had put on a conference called Blockdown D-Data, and the idea was to start basically an inaugural conference around just ideas around how, you know, what does data look like in general, data plus blockchain, you know, and into the into the next few years. And there are a bunch of projects as a part of that. There's a little bit of a story to it, but we, I saw this talk by Dan Reeser from Kala, and he talked about in Miami, BTC Miami, I think it was, and he was like, talking about how Gavin in one of his first talks or sorry, one of his first posts about Polkadot talked about a post Snowden web. And so instantly, you know, we were trying to get Gavin and, you know, some lumen and we had already had Edward Snowden secured for this conference. And I was like, post Snowden web, like these guys sort of cross pollinated each other in this way. And I was like, we need to get them together. We need to get them talking. And so, yeah, I hustled it and, and and we tried to get in touch with Gavin's people, put it together in a few days, and like five days later was the conference and we did it and I was stunned, you know, and I think I did a good job of not looking like I was stunned during the interview, but yeah, I sort of moderated them talking. It was, it was really wonderful. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. What were some of like the takeaways? Like what was like the aha moment from the interview? One of my aha moments was, was Gavin saying that the technologies that we work on and he was specifically talking about Polkadot, but was Gavin saying that, you know, but in general, I think it can be um, extrapolated. The technologies that we work on in blockchain are not a matter of interpretation. They're actually a matter of natural law. And I think that that was extremely profound because, I mean, it's not untrue that the, whatever we do in blockchain ultimately boils down to consensus mechanisms, which are math, which is the universe, which, is, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so it very much is natural. Uh, and I was just like, wow, that is profound. Mm -hmm. From Edward, I took away a key moment that I took away from him was that he had this really interesting counter narrative to metaverse that I thought that that really made me pause and consider. He said, you know, listen, if you're sitting in your basement and, you know, you're playing a video game and then somebody asks, you know, says you need to buy like this, you know, NFT to be able to play the video game. I mean, doesn't that take away from, you know, like, you know, if you, it doesn't that sort of, isn't that a little bit like fleecing or rapacious or isn't this actually like not a good thing? And, and they, the two of them had a little bit of a, a central debate around that. And you can, check it out if you're curious but mm -hmm. that you know i did he took this really interesting counter narrative that i hadn't thought of i i disagree with it but ultimately but i thought it was interesting to consider yeah it's hard to force somebody to buy an nft in the middle of the game you know <laughs> i mean it's usually volunteer you want to get to the next level you buy the skin or whatever I can, we can interview my son about that <laughs> yeah absolutely you should i mean i think nfts will serve ultimately a utility purpose as their most important purpose um, rather than, you know, sort of like this sort of, I don't know, uh, collectible purpose. Yeah. Why don't we round it out with, you know, sure. what's the most pressing challenge that you see marketers facing today? I think in general, marketers are facing a big challenge of knowing where to go knowing like, how do I appeal to the people that I want to talk to, right? And and where do I find them? And how do I find them? And once I've got them, how do I keep them? How do I deal with the fickleness of a community that I'm inculcating, right? Um, I think that's really a, a particular challenge in the crypto sphere and marketing, because sometimes our communities can be very speculatively oriented, and they have no necessarily long-term allegiance to your brand, but only insofar as, you know, you're attached to your token value of your native token. So there are particular challenges to marketing within crypto. I don't know. I mean, I'm curious because I, I, I think you have way more experience than I do, how you conceive of some of the challenges that you've experienced. I think some of the biggest challenges is that, like when I think about Brave specifically, is that marketers, they all want to be focused on privacy. They want to do Web3. They want to be doing decentralized, but they also want to track consumers. They want to know if a purchase was happened, who the impression was served to, did they make the purchase? And they're a real like dichotomy against each other. Just they're, they're like, you know, the exact opposites, like not tracking versus tracking. And I think that marketers are really challenged by that right now because they say, yeah, we're all about privacy. When you get into the weeds, they're all about tracking. 
Yeah, and I remember a few years ago when we first met, this was like basically this sort of central kind of like tension that we kind of talked about, right? Yeah. And and I really like I'm super optimistic and hopeful that some of the technical in- infrastructure that's getting developed right now is going to really help us, I guess, like overcome that tension because to the extent that people are going to be, I hope, really self-custodying that to some extent, like, I think that that tension won't necessarily exist as much as it does now. And part of that tension is also because we don't necessarily know who's real, right? We, there's yeah. a lot of fakeness. A lot of fraud, a lot of bots going on on the internet, for sure. Precisely. Especially when there's compensation, right? Even like if you were selling someone's genome for five to five to fifty thousand dollars someone's gonna think of a way to create a fake genome to get that money yeah yeah absolutely and this is this is a basic computer science help problem right that you, you know anything a human a bot or a human can do a bot can do and i actually hope that through the development of, of decentralized identities in web3 we actually will start to get to a point where we can overcome that basic computer science problem and how we would do that is, you know, you can think about your did as like a backpack. And if you're doing all these verifiable credential attestations that go into that backpack, over time, it becomes almost impossible for a bot to have all of the accrued reputation, history, attestations that is contained within that did, right? So I think it, it holds a ton of promise to make some of these dynamics more efficient, right? Yeah, good. Any last words for the listeners and how can they get in touch with you? I always feel that's ominous when people say last words because I feel like I'm about to die or, or get in the electric yeah. chair or something. No, but I, I didn't joke. Um, but final words, uh, I just hope everybody has a great uh, weekend and I hope everybody is like safe and there's, you know, Ukraine stuff is going on and think about that. And if whatever, be kind to each other. I know that sounds generic. And I'm really excited about Web3 identity all of that and uh they can get in touch with me through i guess my my twitter if they really want to which is just my first and last name at dylan dudney or they can jump on our telegrams for uh nft3 or kylan and yeah that's that's all all i've got to say for my final words thanks so much donnie Thanks again for listening to the Brave Marketer Podcast. To stay up to date on all things Brave, sign up to the Brave Ads Insider Newsletter at brave.com forward slash ad news. You'll get tips for advertising in a cookie world, exclusive content industry insights, best practices for consumer privacy, and more. If you'd like to get started on your Brave Ads campaign or speak to someone from the team, email adsales at brave.com. That's adsales at brave.com. And finally, musical credit goes to my older brother, Ari DeVorn, who provides inspiration every single day. Until next time.